Well, hello, friends. My name is Norton Rainey, CEO of Ace Scholarships. Thank you so much for joining into our podcast with an incredible leader nationally, the former governor of the great state of Florida, Jeb Bush. Governor Bush, thank you so much for joining us here today. Norton, it's great to be with you. We're going to have a little fun to our audience talking about this issue that we know and that we love so very much, and that is education in America and school choice. And what we believe is the most important issue because every family, regardless of their income, should have access for their kids to go to the school of their choice. And so before we begin our Q&A, a bit more about this amazing man, Governor Bush. Governor Bush was the 43rd governor of the state of Florida, serving from 1999 through 2007. During his two terms, Governor Bush cut taxes, vetoed earmarks, and championed major reform of government programs. Under his leadership, Florida led the nation in job growth. In education, Florida raised academic standards, required accountability in public schools, and created the most ambitious school choice programs in the nation. As a result, Florida students have made the greatest gains in academic achievement, and Florida is one of a handful of states to significantly narrow the achievement gap. Prior to and after his tenure as Florida's chief executive, Governor Bush was actively involved in the private sector, helping to build the largest full-service real estate company in South Florida, and owning and operating successful consulting and investing business. Governor Bush maintains his passion for improving the quality of education for students by serving as the chairman of the Foundation for Excellence in Education, a national nonprofit organization he founded to work with education leaders, teachers, parents, and advocates to develop and implement reforms that lead to rising student achievement. Governor Bush lives in Miami with his beautiful family they have three children, and he's married to Columba. Governor Bush, you are a remarkable man, and I can't wait to hear your thoughts on education because you truly are one of the great leaders in this country. And having been involved at ACE now for 23 years, Florida has always been the envy of the country. And so we're going to talk about Florida and what you did with your tax reforms there, and also the new program this year, Education Savings Accounts. But before we jump into education here, Tell us a little bit more about your childhood and growing up in such an amazing family, the Bush family, where we all know you. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about yourself growing up and what it was like being a Bush. So I was born, gosh, 70 years ago. It's really almost impossible for me to actually articulate. It's, um, I'm, I'm still trying to, I'm getting, I have therapy to get through this uh, milestone in my life. But 70 years ago, I I was in the Midland Hospital. I woke up, my little eyes open, and and there was Barbara Bush. And so we talk about privilege a lot um, in different ways these days. And I would say what an incredible amount of good fortune to be the son of George and Barbara Bush uh, because they taught me all the things that you would need to be, you know, need to know they pounded it into me to be, you know, to live a successful life and whatever mistakes I've made. And I've, I've had more than my fair share. Um, I'm as imperfect in, in God's watchful eye as anybody else. They're my own doing. I've, I've, I've had, a, I had an incredible childhood um, that was, uh, uh, you know, we, it wasn't a privilege like we got to do a bunch of stuff. We were growing up in Midland. It was pretty, you know, it was a pretty normal existence, little league baseball, um, lots of sports, lots of, uh, being outside in the neighborhood, lots of reading. My mom was, uh, inculcated in that in us in an early age. And, you know, I was inspired. I'm so lucky to have my dad as a role model, um, throughout, you know, as a kid, teenager, as a young adult, and as an adult, he's always been my, my guidepost. So, you know, lucky as hell. So the way I describe my, how I grew up, first in Midland, then in Houston. And then um, in, uh, I, I went to the University of Texas and I graduated uh, really quick because I had met my wife in high school and I fell madly in love with her. So my life can be defined by uh, before Columba, BC and AC after Columba. And the AC part was uh, where, you know, 50 years of marriage now almost. Uh, has been an incredible blessing for me. And she's the one that got me focused on working hard, being successful, because I mm -hmm. wanted to marry her. She she didn't, she, she was a little slower on the uptake than I was on that <laughs> regard, but we, we, we got married uh, 49 years ago. 
and we, we have three kids. So the greatest influence in my life certainly were my parents. And secondly, would be my wife. Oh, that's a great story. And there's nothing nicer than having a spouse that can help you achieve your dreams. And obviously the American dream is being successful. And you certainly have been able to do that to a T. When we think about your dad, and I think about your mother as well, in their later years, stories came out about how much fun they had. And I remember one time seeing your dad when, I can't recall if he turned 90 years old, or maybe it was a little younger than that, he went skydiving. Was your father always a fun-loving kind of guy where he liked to joke in addition to being this great leader that was taking on serious issues in our country? You know, he he was, uh, he definitely was fun-loving, um, but he got more fun-loving as he went along. I think our elders always, there's something that happens. You get, you know, you put away all the pretenses and um, you live life to the fullest. And my dad's post-presidency was a model for people um, aging. He didn't age, you know, he aged with dignity, of course, but he aged with a zest for life. And he, you know, he aged helping people. He aged having fun, staying connected with his friends and family. He's a great grandfather. Um, and he, you know, he got shot down in the Pacific at the age of 20 or 21, almost was picked up uh, by a, a Japanese uh, boat, but he got picked up by the SS Finback. And thankfully, that was the case because the garrison commander uh, on Chichijima Island was convicted of war crimes for cannibalism afterwards. Mm -hmm. If he was a POW, I might not be talking to you right now. So um, based on that experience, I think he wanted to jump out of a plane in the proper way. And he did it five or six times in his um, post-presidential life, including I think the last one might have been 88, might have been 90, but he could barely walk. But he, you know, <laughs> he flew out of, <laughs> jumped out of a plane. And speaking of the military, I know that you registered for the draft after you graduated from the University of Texas, and you weren't chosen to go to the military, but you had a deep love for our country. So tell us more about your desire to follow in your dad's footsteps and register for the draft and why it was important for you to join the military in a time when our country needed you. Um, you know, there's the, the chance to serve is always important, and that was part of our, our, our life. Um, I was, we, our year, my year was the, the first year that the draft didn't, there was not a, it was a mandatory draft and they stopped drafting people. So the war was winding down. Um, and I wanted to get out of college and, you know, start my family, which is what I've done. So I've tried to work to help people support the military and governors have a great chance to do that in so many ways. And we have like 28 commands in the state. Uh, we worked really hard to make sure that their families were taken care of, our guard as well. Um, both the military and the police, I think, should be in the front of the line in terms of support, both civic as well as political support. It's heartening to see that happening here in Florida, and I'm sure it's happening across the country. Your grandfather was a United States senator. Your father was a United States senator, the vice president of the United States, and of course, the president, and your brother, the president. And Service seems to be a part of the Bush family. And in 1999, you were elected to be governor of Florida. What caused you to run for election to be governor? And when you were elected as governor, tell us about your top priorities that you wanted to bring to the state of Florida. Yeah, so um, I was, uh, my desire to serve, I would give my dad complete credit. We were taught that to be important, not necessarily serve through politics. My dad didn't get involved in the political arena till he was 40. So he had a long career of, you know, really important jobs, but it, it started later than people imagine. Um, so service can be a lot of different things, getting involved in your church, getting involved in, you know, the United Way or other, other methods. And we were taught that by my dad. My interest in uh, being governor was driven by when I was Secretary of Commerce for Governor Martinez. I saw, I had a front row seat to see the potential of this job of being governor, which is pretty unique in our American political system. You know, state governments have to balance budgets. They normally have sessions that begin and end within three months. There's not a lot of gibbering and jabbering and subcommittee, blah, 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 like they exist in Washington where they don't, you know, it's just, it's like one big, just, 
chirping noise. You can't see it. I mean, governors, governors lead. And so I was inspired by having seen that. And um, I didn't immediately run for anything, but I, I waited for my dad to finish his service. And then I ran for governor and lost in 94 and then ran more effectively, perhaps in 98, where I won and had a very, I wish we could get back to this as well, um, Norton, which is for candidates to say what they're going to do with enough details to shoot, prove that they're serious about it. So in 98, I ran and I had five or six important things. I believed that they're important, at least that I wanted to get done. I laid them out in detail. I garnered support for them in the campaign. And whether I had a mandate to do it or not, I declared it, you know, like I ran on these things. Um, people wanted them to happen and it gave me momentum to go to the legislature. And we had a, the first session was incredibly successful. It was also the first time a Republican governor with a Republican legislature ever existed in the state's history. So great mature leadership in the legislature that knew that, you know, it was important to get, get this, uh, get the band going correctly, uh, at the very beginning. And, and we had some real success together, working together. And one of the issues that you campaigned on was education. And so going back to your comments about doing what you say you're going to do, you certainly did that with education. As I mentioned earlier, that Florida has really become the gold standard for education reform in our country. So out of curiosity, what prompted you to focus so heavily on education in Florida? I just, I just believe that it was the tool, the single most important thing, if we could get it right, for everybody to have a chance to achieve earned success, to rise up. America at its best is a country where you have a dream. It doesn't have to be the dream that's told you, you know, you're not, no one dictates the dreams that people have. And you pers in the, pers the pursuit of those dreams creates more prosperity, more benefit, more goodness, than any government program. I, I, I've always believed this. And without an education, we trap people uh, where their dreams can't come true. So if you start with that premise and you're 50th out of 50 in high, high school graduation and you're 29th out of 31 on the nation's report card in 1997, and you know the arguments are always more money versus less money, not about rising student achievement, it was like imperative to uh, challenge this. So I did something unique. I went to visit during my campaign. I went to visit and I'm, you know, I believe I've always believed in universal school choice, public, private, you name it. I, I you know, it's con back then it was really controversial to advocate this, but I did. And um, as part of that process, I went to visit 260 schools, almost all of them public schools where, you know, I showed, I showed up and people thought I had horns on and I listened, I learned, I advocated, I, I dehorned myself, you know, with just dogged determination, I guess, visiting all these schools and got, you know, kind of got out. The guy may be crazy, but he has a heart for kids. It's clear that he may be misguided, uh, you know, but he truly cares. Um, and that was an important lesson if you can neutralize people that are opposed to your views and you can motivate people that are supportive, you're going to be more successful in implementing. And the bigger, the bigger the challenge, the bigger the policy objective, the more important it is to do that. And um, so those, that, that wandering around was really important. And then I had a very specific plan, grade schools, A through F based on student learning, ending social promotion in third grade and creating an early childhood literacy program public and private school choice started with opportunity scholarships and expanded way beyond that. Um, and those, that, the, that fundamental foundation got past the very first two years. And from there created another iteration of reform, expanded uh, parental choice being a dominant part of that, but other things as well. So success is never final, reform is never complete. It's a journey. You don't check the box in this stuff. You know, you've got, uh, you, know, you there, there should be a passion to always challenge a system that has not been modernized uh, and it's not diverse enough for the diversity of the students that, that it takes care of. Well said. So in 1999, when you're elected governor, 
the hot topic in school choice was vouchers. And you created this innovative tax credit program. And I'm curious, were you the first state to create tax credits? And what prompted you as well to use this program to utilize donations from corporations and individuals to claim a credit to raise money versus just taking government money through a voucher program? Can you talk more about that? Sure. So the first program we had was a voucher program, um, but it was tied to failing schools. So it was a small program, but it was the first statewide voucher program in the country. Milwaukee had a pretty robust voucher program, but it wasn't statewide. Uh, the tax credit program was created as a means to avert what, what we thought to be a likely um, court challenge, which did turn out to be the case. And our voucher program was ruled unconstitutional. But the beauty of the tax credit program was you, the, the money never touched the coffers of government. And so therefore, uh, there was a better chance of, of that um, uh, program to be held up in court. Um, and the good news is that our Supreme Court changed, it, the, make, the makeup changed over time. Today, it's an incredibly solid, conservative, uh, non-overreaching uh, Supreme Court. Back then it wasn't. So the tax credit program achieved, it was for low-income kids. It achieved a really important objective. And now we've moved to the next iteration of this with a series of other uh, parental choice programs. And ultimately now what will be called HB1 for a while at least, uh, that's been signed into the law by government, meld, merges all these together to universal school choice where parents have an array of choices, including customizing the learning experience, taking part of the funding that goes to for their child uh, to take, you know, to, to have tutoring or some specialized uh, um, focus for their child, or they can go to a private school, or they can homeschool and do partial work at the public school, or they can go to another public school. This is the dream come true. This is what has been the aspiration for many people. I know it's been yours as well. Um, and it's not income based. And for kids in the private schools already, their, their parents will be able to access this as well. Now, the implementation of this is, is going to be important. Our foundation is probably the leading expert. I mean, we, along with many others, have been advocating this, but we're, without a doubt, we're the leading expert on how you implement a really complex and complicated process. And we're excited about it because um, you got to get that right in terms of fiscal integrity and the flexibility that parents want. Um, this will transform education and it'll make it better. It's not going to hurt public schools. It's going to make all right. schools better. Governor, my good friend, Brad Formza, has a podcast called The Wow Factor. And when someone says something that he loves, he says, that is a wow factor right there. And <laughs> I wanted to say there's a wow right here because what you didn't do, because you're way too humble to say this, and I'll say it for you. The Florida program, the tax credit program, is raising close to $1 billion on an annual basis right now. And I want yeah. to put that in perspective for anyone who's listening here. That is $1 billion, and that is enormous impact for the lives of countless number of children. Can you talk about what that means, how many kids are being impacted, how many schools, and how the communities in Florida are now being reformed because of the $1 billion that's being raised on an annual basis? So if you take the corporate tax scholarship program, it's, it's around a billion. Interestingly, I mean, you're reaching the point where it's hard. I mean, the, we don't have... We have corporate taxes that don't go much beyond that. So there's an issue there. But you also have the McKay Scholarship Program that's been melded, which was for any parent who has an IEP, an individual education plan mandated by the, uh, you know, by the federal government, a civil rights uh, right. Um, if they don't think their IEP is being met, they can go to any school of their choice and take the state and local dollars with them. That was called the McKay Scholarship. Then there was a more customized version called the Gardner Scholarship. Those came out of the funding formula. And now HB1 has come, which is universal um, ESAs. The tax credit program will continue, um, but it's universal now. It's not for uh, up to 400% of 
poverty. It's for everybody. So the, the, the point being, we fund parents, not systems now. Mm -hmm. And that's what all schools in every state should have. That's, that, that should be the way it should work. We do that for healthcare. We do it for all sorts of other transfer payments. Seems to me that this is a logical step for, for K-12 education as well. And I think what you're going to find is there's going to be a lot more innovation, a lot more. Every child's unique. Every child has challenges. Every child, you know, child has great potential. Their parents are the ones that know best. And so whether it's a tax credit child or someone getting funding with one of our um, um, programs for, for kids with unique, dis, you know, unique abilities, or now this expanded program, um, we're empowering parents and trusting them more than the bureaucracy. And for the life of me, I don't know why this was, you know, why it was controversial <laughs> to begin with, but it sure was. And, and, and why is it important? Well, apart from improving the chance for children to live purposeful lives, which is the most important thing, it also empowers communities. So in Florida, you know, you have, we have universal pre-K and we have these expanded private school choice programs. Those programs are the deliverers of those services, if you will, um, are Hispanic churches, black churches, community organizations, um, Catholic, you know, the archdiocese, the beneficiaries are the community organizations that create strong communities. And so the secondary effect is that you're also rebuilding in some cases, particularly in the low income areas, you're fortifying the institutions that people trust and rely on along the way. And you're building a political constituency where moms now say, hey, you can't take this away from me. Right. I want to be treated with respect. And so right. my guess is if we implement the the uh, universal ESA appropriately in the state, I'm confident they will, um, you're going to see we're not going to turn back. Right. And you'll have you, you reach a point in the not too distant future where a, a large majority of parents choose where their kid goes to school. Well said. I love how you said that we wanted to fund parents, not fund systems here. And I think so often we forget about the work we're doing, that these are real people whose lives are being impacted. And we have all these platitudes. We talk often about how our students are graduating at higher rates, how they're persisting to college, how they're graduating from college and then securing jobs, which, as we know, is enormous economic impact in our country. And the stats are really good. The stats are on our side. We know that. But you got to quantify this sometimes by thinking about these real people whose lives are being radically changed right now. And I'm curious, is there one parent or one child that you can recall from your time in Florida that through your efforts, their life has been changed? And can you tell us that story that really puts us in perspective how important this work is? Not sure I could pick one. I mean, I know thousands and thousands of examples because I stay connected. When I was governor, you know, I gave out my email address, jeb at jeb.org, and I got a lot of incoming. And a lot of thanks for starting these programs and, and seeing them grow. But, you know, a, a quick example is the guy that is the owner of my UPS store, the franchisee. Uh, the first time I went in there that he had taken over the store, he said, I want to thank you. And I said, for what? And he said, um, I'm, I, I was a beneficiary in high school of the corporate tax scholarship program. And I got to go, my parents couldn't afford to go to a private school but thanks to that, I did. And my life was turned around. The high school I was at was difficult. It didn't, didn't touch me, didn't reach me. I was on the wrong track. And now I'm a small business person. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That happens in public supermarkets when I'm, there's, there's a lot of examples, just anecdotal. Um, there's a woman who is a good friend now, Denisha Merriweather, who works for um, sure. American Federation for Children one of the leading advocates for parental choice. She's now a mom, has a beautiful little girl. But when she was in uh, elementary school, she was held back two years in a row. And, you know, her family was relatively dysfunctional at the time. Her godmother heard about the corporate tax scholarship program, 
got her to go to a Christian school that was in the neighborhood. It wasn't one of the elementary school that she was failing at. And she, uh, in two years time, overcame those two years of loss. She caught up with her class or age group. She was the first, she graduated from high school. She was the first in her family to graduate from college and graduate school. And she is a delightful, you know, civic minded, uh, producer, not a taker. She's adding value to the lives of so many people because her godmother and her family were given this choice. Um, kids with learning disabilities, families. I mean, I can't tell you the untold times where parents are so frustrated because, um, difficult to teach kids in the public setting are a burden, you know, and they don't want to deal with it. They also have the federal law behind them. So they have some not quite equal footing, but they can fight and they're passionate about their kids and giving them chances. Um, like, uh, my friend Elaine had for, you know, for her, for her, uh, for her boy, Jeremy, um, he was going to languish and he got to go to a specialized school and he's graduating from high school um, today is the, uh, what's it called? The salutatorium. You mm -hmm. know, this stuff happens all the time. And it's not to say the public schools are bad. They're not. Um, one of the things I really have learned at least to appreciate is the fact that it's a struggle to be a teacher in public schools. And they're great public schools. But the point is, all of them, everybody needs to get better. And all schools get better when parents have more choices. It's it's. Right. Why is that such a illogical thing? I mean, it's it's it works in every aspect of our lives, right? Why wouldn't it work when you 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 not you got to make sure parents are informed consumers of this? I mean, they have to have information where they make informed choices. But I trust them every day, every day. Right. Yeah. Well said. And I also like how you talk about we have some heroic teachers that really do care about these children, and we have some institutions and schools that are feeling our children. And that's where families have to be able to choose the environment that's right for them. And I hearken back way, to the- A lot of Florida teachers take advantage of these programs. Because they know it's going to be the right place for their children. And one of size doesn't They all. should have that right. Why not? Absolutely. I mean, I, I love the example. We've all heard this before, but in the 80s before FedEx existed, we had one way of shipping and that was for UPS and that was snail mail. If you wanted to send a package to someone overnight, you couldn't do it. And then FedEx came along and they said, hey, we can actually ship your package overnight. And we had choices that gave us an opportunity to do things. And then everyone upped their game. UPS all of a sudden started doing the same and others came on the marketplace like UPS. And uh, we have more choices. And that's the same in education. That's really why we focus on this great issue. I remember many years ago, we had former Secretary of Education, Bill Bennett, as a keynote speaker in Denver. And prior to his speech, we had this young lady who spoke and she shared her story of triumph that when she received a scholarship to a school, it changed her life. And I learned something about Bill Bennett I didn't know at that time. He came up and said, ladies and gentlemen, I am throwing up my speaking notes here because I was so impacted by that story. Because what most people don't know is that my brother and I are just like that young lady whose life was impacted because I grew up in a household in New York with a single parent. And I was given a scholarship to go to a local Catholic school and it totally changed my life and it totally changed my brother's life as well. And it was a great story of inspiration. And we hear these stories all the time. So knowing these great successes that we see in our program, why are people still opposing education reform in our country? Um, I think there are a couple of reasons. One, the economic interests of the adults are threatened by this. Okay. That's, you know, if you have a monopoly and it's designed uh, and it's, you know, you're resisting accountability, even if you have great teachers that have a heart for kids, if you have no, you know, there's no accountability. It's designed basically to protect the economic interests of the folks that work in the 13,000 government run, unionized, politicized school districts. Anything that's different that that takes power away from that system is a threat. So, you know, you, the unions, um, people get all upset about unions. They're doing their damn job. Yeah, their job isn't to have 
kids rise up to learning. We're protecting teachers, that is. Yeah. They're, they're focused on the economic interests of some of the public sector workers in the K-12 system, not all, including teachers, depending on the state. That's their job. We shouldn't be surprised that they work really, really, really hard to protect those interests in a collective way. Um, it's not to bring, bring about rising student achievement. And they use the political process to do it. So the rather than express surprise about why unions act the way they do, you need to confront them politically and respect the fact that they're doing their job. And it's up to us to, to do the, you know, to, to advocate for our, our position in the political realm. Right. Um, and then the second, the second idea that um, makes our challenge hard has been the idea that somehow public schools have been the great equalizer, which is an idyllic notion in some ways that, you know, maybe a hundred years ago, first of all, there was more of a shared identity in our country. And I, my hope and prayer is that we get back to some sense of what, what it is to be an American. Public schools perpetuated that, which was really positive and hopeful. Um, I don't think they do that today. And I don't think that they're the great equalizer today. But that, that notion still holds on. You can hear people that are smart people, you know, that believe that public education uh, is the same as it once was literally a century ago, and it's important to maintain. Well, the world has changed. Public education has become much more stasis. It doesn't, I don't think, focus as much on shared values as, as maybe people think. And um, it disrespects, it's become highly bureaucratic and highly political, and it disrespects parents a lot more than, than, um, than it used to. Right. So COVID was the sucker punch that hit us all on so many different yep. levels in our country. But one thing that happened with COVID, which is the silver lining, is that parents learn with their kids for being educated in school. And many times it was a lack of education where they saw their children weren't learning and, um, they were falling behind even further, and that was unacceptable to parents. And because of that, we've seen this incredible surge in the school choice movement this year. And you reference ESAs or education savings accounts, these innovative programs that now allow, allow parents to have choice more than ever, which is a really cool thing. So when you think about the surge this year and you look at our country and the work that you're doing at Excellence in Education, you must be very proud of the states that passed ESA programs this year. Talk a little bit about what this will do for the four states who have currently passed these programs, what it will do for the children in those states, but more importantly, how will this be an example to the rest of the country? And what do you think is going to happen over the next few years because of these innovative programs that are now being passed? Yeah, I mean, I'm older than dirt and I've been an advocate for this. Long before I was governor, uh, we created Floridians for Educational Choice, I think in 1991, that advocated a version of ESAs way back then. And to see the progress that's been made in the last three or four years, it's just, it's rewarding. And it's also very exciting because there's a lot of hard work to implement these programs faithfully. So West Virginia created an ESA that will be implemented starting this year, um, three or four years ago. Arizona last year under the leadership of Governor Ducey and um, great leadership in the legislature, did the same last year. Now Utah, Iowa, Arkansas, and Florida have done have done the same thing, different versions, but the, you know, there's a universality attached to these CSAs. And um, North Carolina might do it this year with because uh, they can override the veto of the governor. They have a universal ESA bill in front of them. South Carolina was there yesterday, uh, day before yesterday, and they, they will pass an expansion of their ESA program, not a full-blown universal one. Gosh, I'm missing like five or six states. Oklahoma is going to pass. They've been work, Governor Stitt's been working really hard on this. So there's an explosion. Like the state of Texas. Do you think anything will happen oh, in Texas? About Texas. <laughs> you know, we're, we, we, along with many others, are working hard there. Um, Let's hope so. I, I, the the I, you know the the argument in Texas is not dissimilar to Iowa and other places, which is the rural schools will be hurt. There's no evidence that rural schools are hurt by ESAs. None. 
You know, there's very few private options there. And uh, why shouldn't parents of rural schools have that may have children with unique needs be able to customize their learning experience as well? So um, it's, you know, they're, you know, schools, there's 200, I don't know how many, there's 200 plus uh, school schools, uh, counties in the state. There must be, you know, 500 school districts. They're the largest employer in many of these towns. So there's an economic threat, but I think there's a pretty good possibility that Texas will follow suit as well, at least for beginning the process may not be universal. But that's not all there is. There's also been incredible work on, on, on casting aside these really dysfunctional means of teaching reading for younger kids. The idea of using whole language as the basis for uh, the beginning journey for kids to learn to read when you use three cueing, where you're guessing the words rather than sounding them out and understanding what they mean and having it registered in this, you know, your fast growing brain as a, as a young person, as the building block that then allows kids to, to learn reading. You know what the number one state is in the country now in terms of learning gains on reading? Which one? Mississippi. Mississippi embraced the Florida model and made it better in some ways. And they taught teachers how to teach reading. They ended social promotion in third grade. They got philanthropy behind it. And Mississippi went from 49th or 50th out of the country on the fourth grade NAEP test to at the national average. Now they're slightly above the national average. And they're the only gain, only state that's had any perceptible gains um, during, after, you know, during COVID. So there's broader policy areas. Empowering parents is a phenomenally important first step, but there's other initiatives that are taking place around the country now as well. And it started with parents like waking up and saying, hey, it's not as good as I thought it was. It needs to get better. And um, it's an exciting time for reformers, for sure. It really is. And you said earlier that you know, your oldest dirt, which by the way, you look great. So when you say your oldest dirt, <laughs> I'm telling you, if I can look as good as you in a couple of years here, I'll be the happiest guy in the world. But I think the whole principle here, what you just said there is you got to keep fighting and you've been yeah. fighting for a long time. And there were many times where there was that sucker punch and you could have gone down and not gotten up again. And I think many people in this movement have felt that way, but you just keep moving. You just keep persisting and great things happen. And so I want to applaud you because again, not only were you a leader when you were a governor, but you continue to fight at a national level and be a person that we follow. And so we appreciate your leadership. And my goodness, when you think once again about what's occurred in this country this year, it is special. And I love your comments about Mississippi. Governor Tate Reeves, I had a unique opportunity to meet with him three months ago with some of our national board members who are from Louisiana that are actually helping us launch an ACE program in Mississippi. And Governor Reeves was very enthusiastic about ACE coming to a state. And he also was bragging about these reforms as well. And he it said, but I love it. Our public schools are doing better, but also families still should have choice. And so this whole keep fighting adage is critical. And you certainly have lived that to a T. Well, Norton, you know, if you look at it, um, the reform agenda needs to be, it's different in different places. So there are some places that I would put Texas on this list. Texas should be further along on the, on the continuum of parental choice. Um, but they'll make that first step in some fashion, maybe this year. Uh, and then that'll create the opportunity for another step. And ultimately, they'll take the big leap. Similarly, Indiana, Florida, I mean, Utah had small parental choice programs. And they went to a universal ESA because... There was a, you know, there was a, a politics is sausage making. There was a commitment for higher teacher pay in return for universal ESAs. Gosh, I mean, that's how it works. And so you have to seize the moment when it comes, but you have to be in it for the long haul. And the other thing that I would urge people to recognize is passing a law and having a, a really cool signing ceremony. I love doing those. Uh, is the first step. It's not the end of the journey. Right. Then you've got to go journey. through all of the complicated. Who who's going to be the uh, who has the authority to collect the money? How do you prioritize the spending to make sure that it's done right? 
what is the degree of regulation that private schools would have to um, adhere to if there's to be public money coming into their coffers? How do you provide information for parents so that they're informed consumers as they make these choices? Can you, how do you appropriate the money? How do you, I mean, there are a ton of questions that need to be answered because if you don't get that part right, it kills reform all over the place because people say, see, see what happened when, you know, Governor Schmidlap screwed up in the implementation of their ESA bill. There is no Governor Schmidlap, by the way, just for the record. (laughs) Um, You know, it's so our foundation is going to focus like a laser beam on this faithful implementation of legislative intent. Um, It's not easy. Right. A lot of the advocates kind of check the box and move on to the next thing and celebrate the success, which is great. But um, a lot of these folks that are being given this responsibility are going to be really beleaguered when they start saying, oh, my God, this is this is going to be hard. And the final thing I'd say about this that makes it even harder is you're asking a system that is opposed to the idea to implement it. Hmm. Think about that for a moment. That's a really good point there. And you're right. It's a black eye on the movement if we don't execute and do it correctly. We've got a great gentleman who runs our policy efforts. And thank you, by the way, too, for the work you do at Excellence in Education, because you're a resource to the work we do. Um, As everyone who's listening to this right now can tell, when you've got Governor Bush giving you insights on policy, you better be listening because this is someone who knows what he's doing. And so we take to heart what you say. But his line was that so often after a bill is passed, that people pack up their suitcases and they go home and implementation is something that you forget. So that's a really excellent point there. And that's where with these grand programs being created, we need to really make sure that we execute this year and all the programs participate in this implementation. They've got their work cut out for them. And you're what you guys do, by the way, Norton is you kind of, you till the soil. So Mississippi doesn't have a lot of, I mean, they have, they have a, modest uh, ESA program, I believe. I think they do. Maybe they don't even have that. They have a small charter uh, community there. Um, But there's, you know, there's interest in it. And if you have a private uh, alternative to start, you you create kind of the momentum effect that allows for the public policy then to be implemented. So you're, you're Johnny Appleseed. Right. You show from example what happens when you give choice. And you know, we love sharing our data. We love our data. I remember our founder, Alex Cranberg, he, he has a line and said that I've never met anyone who supports school choice and they lo- no longer support choice. But I know countless numbers of people who did not support school choice and now they do support school choice. Yeah. That's a really uh, great story. I know until they're convinced otherwise, I know a ton of people that believe choices are an American part of the American way, but don't believe that. They, you know, parents should have choices in public education. Once you kind of point out that you go to the supermarket and you have 30 different options for milk. Right. And you're told that you have to go to an assigned school. Which one is the American way? And then, you know, you get people thinking and it, their their resistance to this idea begins to subside. And now you have policymakers that are big and bold implementing stuff that's really exciting. Right. It it really doesn't matter where you come from, what your ethnicity is or what your socioeconomic situation is. Education is the great equalizer, and that is the American dream. All right. So as you think about where we are at this time and the great successes, what can people do to assist the school choice movement? Well, I'm going to support you guys. That'd be a good way to start. Um, Support the efforts underway in the states. There are a lot of advocacy groups that are that are working hard. If you want to support Excel in Ed, go online www.excelined. It's pretty simple. .com or .org. Um, so provide support for the folks that are that are you know gladiators fighting the fight. Um, the other thing I think is important is to if you have any influence on the political process to convince legislators, governors school board members to see that uh, the best path forward is to assure that every child has a chance to achieve earn success through a high quality education. And every child doesn't, every child's different. 
So their options should be different as well. Um, get involved in the debate. You can get involved in your Rotary Club and get involved in the debate through your church, through your, if you're in the political process, start, start, start persuading people how important this is. Gosh, I mean, we're living in a world where our politics seems so stupid. Like if you watch, just if your Martian came down and saw the fighting we're having <laughs> right now and didn't have any background information, you know, holy shamoly. I mean, it's it, the, the D.C. focus and the national focus doesn't seem really meaningful and relevant for families. This is really relevant and this is really meaningful. And um, it's not as uh, ideological. There's a moral underpinning here that I think is important. And so get informed and get involved. Yeah, well said. That's great. And I would agree for everyone listening, do support Governor Bush's organization, Excellent Education. They really are leading the way on the policy front nationally. And there are some amazing leaders in this country. We have great partners, don't we, that are locking arms yeah. and we're not competing with one another. We're actually helping each other out because it's all about the kids. And it's a beautiful thing to see. Hey, in closing, let me ask you this question here. If someone listening can walk away with one thing, what are the benefits of school choice and why are you an advocate of it? Let's drive that point home. I believe in America, parents, the most important thing parents can do is to make sure their children have a high quality education that allows them to pursue their dreams as they see fit. And we need to empower, empower parents, inform them and empower them for them to make that decision. It is a public good for them to do so. And the best way to do it is to give them an abundance of choices. And that's the path forward for our country's success. If we, if we stratify, continue to stratify our country, the haves and have nots are not going to be based on income. They're going to be based on access to, um, to, you know, to learning. If you can't learn now, I don't know if you've gone on GP chat. I mean, we're, we're on the, we're on the edge of one of the greatest periods of innovation that will be revolutionary and scary. And the only way to ride that technological wave is to have a high quality education behind you. And the only way for that to happen to everyone is to make sure that parents are empowered to make these choices. Boom. So good. <laughs> it's great. What a great message for us to walk away with. And let me just say once again, thank you for your leadership, for inspiring us to do greater things and believing in America. I walk away from this today, being more inspired to live in the United States of America. And I just want to thank you again, because uh, we love following you and we appreciate you so very much. And thank you. Thank you, Norton. And thanks for all the work that you guys do.